Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Milligan, the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of ABIT. And for those who don't know, ABIT is an accrediting organization focused on the disciplines of the applied sciences, computing, engineering, and engineering technology. ABIT's had a long history in the area of outcomes-based education and assessment since adopting the outcomes-based educational approach in the mid-1990s. We currently accredit over 4,300 programs in 40 countries, and over 200,000 students graduate from ABIT programs each year. Today, I'd like to talk about the impact of OBE and some of the challenges we face moving forward. Today, we face some of the most daunting challenges of our lifetime, and it's a real warning to all of us. All around us, we see our planet under constant pressure, and the current and future generations of STEM students must lead the way in developing solutions to our many complex problems. As an example, <clears throat> within these past few months, we've seen record-setting high temperatures throughout Europe that have caused the deaths of over 200, I'm sorry, 2,000 people in Spain and Portugal alone. And many predict this will become the new normal for summer temperatures in this part of the world. We've also seen record setting fires around the world, in Europe for sure, but also the United States, Australia, as well as many other countries. And this is not just a recent event. In the US, for example, fires have raged out of control for the past decade at least, and the pace is quickly picking up. Last year, for example, we experienced over 23,000 wildfires, which destroyed millions of acres of trees and thousands of homes and businesses. And it's all being fueled by the dry forest caused by climate change. We also see glaciers that are melting at ever increasing rates, creating a whole new set of challenges, including rising sea levels all around the world. And this is a particularly critical issue as more than 40% of the world's population live within 100 kilometers of any coast, so they will surely be impacted uh, in future years. We also see a lot of flooding events in, this parts, in, in, these, in all parts of the world, rather. Until recently, many of these were considered to occur once every, say, 100 or 1,000 years, but now we see them happen on a regular basis. So we know our planet and its climate is changing. So we need to act now. Water, of course, is a precious resource. <clears throat> and we see how the climate is changing in such a way that millions of people won't have regular access to it. So we need not uh, we need to change not only how we locate or distribute water, but also how we consume it. And that may be difficult, a challenge unto itself, because it's often a challenge of human behavior and changing human behaviors. Of course, wherever we go, we see more plastic waste everywhere. Once thought to make our lives more convenient, it's now one of our biggest man-made problems. Again, another huge challenge for the STEM professionals of tomorrow to help solve. So that begs the question, are we properly preparing students for the future and all these new challenges that we'll be facing them? I know climate change has been something that we've talked about over the past many years, but ever increasing number of natural disasters over these past few years have really told us that we can't wait any longer. The crisis facing our planet is real and it is now. So how are we preparing our students to address these challenges? And just as important, how are we preparing students entering the global workforce? Will they have all the knowledge, skills, abilities, and educational experiences to be successful? Fortunately, industry plays a large role in determining what students need in their academic programs. For example, ABIT has its own industry advisory council, which helps provide input on how to enhance program content. In addition, those 4,300 uh, programs that I mentioned earlier also have individual industry advisory councils or committees of some type, which feed back directly into their uh, individual programs, again, helping them understand what uh, industry needs in their graduates. I recently attended a joint academic industry workforce summit and heard some of the fam uh, some familiar themes. Uh, for example, there's a shortage of tech workers um, now, and uh, that shortage is only going to increase in the future, and that's all around the world. So we need to produce more uh, people that are competent in, um, in STEM disciplines. We need to ensure that the future workers uh, consider solutions that are uh, sustainable in all phases of their design, as well as product life cycle, critical to solving some of those challenges I talked about just a few minutes ago. 
Uh, we need to increase diversity in all areas. Uh, I think most people understand that the very best solutions to problems come from teams that have uh, members with different backgrounds, different experiences, uh, different ideas. Uh, so certainly we need to do a, a, a better job of uh, increasing diversity. And then again, we need to ensure that uh, we continually examine uh, what the industry needs since the skill set that we need today won't necessarily be the same as the one we need tomorrow. So uh, continually examine what, what the challenges are in terms of the future workforce. As an example, uh, how things have changed pretty rapidly. Um, in just a few short years, the role of your traditional automotive engineer has really transitioned into more of an integrated approach of uh, you know teams consisting primarily of computer engineers, computer scientists, as well as materials uh, scientists, system engineers, uh, mechatronics engineering, and, and so forth. Um, and that's that's just with existing automobiles, right? We see this now. Uh, in the future, though, we'll have automobiles that'll be primarily electric or all electric. And uh, at that point, the majority of uh, professionals working on cars really will be computer engineers and computer scientists. Electric car components, for the most part, will be the same and be sourced from similar um, manufacturers. Uh, you'll buy an electric motor, you'll have batteries, you'll have you know tires and so forth. The main difference in cars will be its brand, you know, how plush will it be, but also most most specifically, uh, what's what kind of software does it have? What kind of systems are going to be using it? So it really is um, being driven per se by uh, by the computing fields. So that's what we need to uh, get students to appreciate and prepare them as they enter this new uh, global workforce. So what about uh, the role of outcomes-based education? How does it make a difference? Well, at ABET, we've had some experience. As I mentioned, um, in the mid-1990s, we transitioned our entire system to outcomes-based accreditation model. You know, we're really interested um, what students are learning and can they demonstrate what they've learned versus what are they being taught. Uh, increasing our focus on making sure students were pr uh, prepared uh, for their chosen profession, since um, ultimately that's what industry wants, students that can step in uh, and uh, graduates rather they can step in and, and start from day one. Um, and most importantly, one of the real benefits we feel that uh, outcomes-based uh, education has done is it, it really encourages innovation because no two programs need to look alike. And as a result, we can really uh, have an impact. Um, we can have different curricula, we can have di different pedagogies, uh, approaches to teaching and so forth, um, critical to, to, de to designing and developing um, modern programs, uh, ones that'll produce graduates that will be able to have an immediate impact in all the areas that are important. Um, back in 2015, uh, just a few years after I took over as the uh, chief executive officer, we went through a rebranding exercise and we changed a little bit about how we sort of um, viewed our role in the world and, and, and in education and so forth. And we went through a strategic rebranding exercise and um, it resulted not just this new logo or new colors and so forth, but um, it really helped identify who we were and what our role was in the world. Uh, and uh, specifically in the area of uh, quality education. Um, and what we found was that our core purpose was to help programs um, produce students that uh, again are uh, ready to enter a global workforce. And I kind of touched on that a bit earlier, but really when we focus all of our efforts around this idea of you know, preparing students again to be successful, to make an impact, um, outcomes-based educational and that approach is gonna be the most effective way to do this. And so I think it's had a huge positive impact in everything that we've done. And I think uh, again, through this rebranding exercise that we went through a few years ago, it helped bring to light um, some of these um, these ideas and uh, allow us to, again, focus on the things that we think are the most important. Uh, here's an example, I think, of how we're using outcomes-based um, education to um, make sure students are prepared. Here are uh, some criteria out of our um, general engineering criteria. And I, I've put in sort of in that black lettering, so numbers two and four, uh, I wanted to highlight some aspects of, of that that would have, that are different than what existed previously. And so now you see a much, much more emphasis now on making sure students um, have an appreciation and can experience, uh, you know, the importance of ensuring that whatever they do in their design and how they conduct themselves professionally focuses on public health, focuses on public safety and, and public welfare. 
and items such as taking into consideration cultural issues, social issues, environmental, economic factors on, in the global context. Of course, that's critically important because for the most part, all goods and services nowadays being designed will in many cases be used uh, throughout the world by people of, of all types. Um, ethics, professional responsibilities also uh, critically important. I think we uh, we all understand um, on that. And then again, you'll see um, sustainability, sustainability called out directly in terms of the economic environment and societal context. So again, I think um, you know making sure that students are um, learning and appreciating these uh, aspects of what we think is important in producing uh, you know future uh, engineer really couldn't be done if we didn't use the uh, sort of the approach of outcomes based education. Again, uh, a, a few more of our criteria this way, uh, or this one, I really wanted to kind of demonstrate that back to this idea of what industry is asking in terms of diversity. Uh, we want students that can function, function effectively on teams, okay, whose members, uh, you know, are collaborative, inclusive, uh, and they establish goals, plan tasks, and so forth. So really the teaming environment, being able to, um, experience that while they're in, in their undergraduate or graduate programs when they get out uh, and then into the workforce they ought to be able to uh, feel comfortable in that environment and of course nowadays everything is about teaming and um, establishing teams to solve problems so this is a critically important um, component of an educational experience that students go through and again uh, the outcomes-based educational approach really is the best way for us to help evaluate and make sure that's happening um, it's interesting, uh, I kind of reflect back on when I graduated from, from an undergraduate, which was in 1983, so almost 40 years ago now, I guess. And at that time, I recall very vividly my uh, senior design project was really um, pretty much focused and evaluated um, purely on this technical solution. So we didn't worry about necessarily so much on the economic impact or the environment or the culture or the societal issues and any of those things. Okay? It was all really about the te uh, technical solution now, you know, we need students that when they finish their programs, yes, we want them to be technically um, competent and, and excel in, in their discipline, but there's so many other factors that come into play that are so important in solving these problems because, you know, these sustainable development goals that I mentioned earlier, they will only be solved as a result of uh, teams of individuals and not just technical people, but it's going to require business people, it's going to require politicians, it's going to require social scientists, and so on and so forth. And so, again, getting students to feel comfortable in working in teaming environments that are diverse and inclusive is, is going to go a long ways towards making them successful. There's something that's happening, though, I'm sure most people are aware of, uh, you know, the recent trend in, in, in building certificate programs, many of you may be in, in that area. Uh, but I did see some headlines recently about, you know, how Google has a plan to disrupt the traditional college degree, if you will, because um, they don't necessarily believe that um, many uh, people need to go to college to be successful in the high tech sector. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges students face really when they're going through a traditional college program is the, the time commitment. And it's typically four to five years, probably more like five years for an undergraduate program, really, for a baccalaureate. And then the, the cost of actually attending college is becoming more and more of a challenge for uh, students around the world. So can we do things better and differently uh, in a different model? And um, Google says yes. <laughs> Google says that actually they probably will end up hiring thousands of students that don't go through traditional program but go through certificate programs and so uh as a as an accreditor of a, of uh, uh, academic programs you know of course we're quite curious about what this all entails and so i took a little bit of a deep dive into what uh this might look like and so went to to google's um educational uh portal, if you will, and looked a little bit about, you know, some of the programs that they have. And so you can see some of the, the nice things that stand out here that, you know, um, many jobs don't require experience uh, in terms of um, college, 
necessarily. Um, many of these programs are self-paced. So if you um, are uh, have good discipline and aggressive, you can get through them in a matter of a few months versus again, four or five years. Uh, employers really like the idea that people uh, are certified in technologies that are, are, are cutting edge and current. Uh, and they, you know, the salaries typically pay fairly well. So there's a big advantage economically to pursuing uh, programs through certificates versus a traditional, uh, again, traditional undergraduate or college program. So I happened to look and uh, see what it would take to be a um, sort of a data analyst if I were going through a certificate program versus again, through a traditional program. And you can see right away, um, <laughs> excuse me, in this, um, uh, this certificate program, they're talking about a matter of weeks, 24 weeks. Again, if you are disciplined and, and go through it sort of full time, of course, you can you can make that longer if, if you're working and, and need to go to you know school part time or whatnot. But the point being is we're talking weeks here. We're not talking years. So very, very attractive to many people that are um, want to get uh, some form of education and get uh, get some uh, you know good high paying jobs. But what kind of struck me um, was this continued uh, focus on outcomes, okay, and sort of this OBE approach, because you'll see right away on page two of this description of what it would uh, take to go through the program uh, and for a data analyst talks about what's the objective. So right away, it tells you, you know, what kind of um, uh, maybe field that uh, that students would be going into and what are the learning outcomes. So you can see they've identified four critical um, learning outcomes right here. So students will know right away what they're expected to know and learn. And this is going to be pretty uh, important because um, students are going to be primarily evaluated on competency, okay? And whether that's through formal graded exercises or, or something different, uh, doesn't really matter because, you know, one of the things that we do know is using an outcomes-based uh, educational approach allows many different methods of, uh, of assessment. And so, um, Again, uh, OBE is, you know, right in the middle of, of um, this new, maybe this next generation of, of learning uh, model. Um, I'm coming up towards the end of my presentation. I guess I just wanted to make a few um, final, a, a few uh, closing remarks rather. Uh, I like to finish on the slide because I think in some ways it really summarizes what we're all about. This is a for those that are familiar with the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, they have a number of grand challenges. They call uh, they call these um, sort of challenges that are facing us uh, and and future um, a future generation of of workers. And one of them is uh, advanced personalized learning. And I think you know this is really understanding how to tailor uh, an educational experience to maximize learning uh, for everyone. I think most of us who have been in a typical undergraduate program or a college program of any type understand that you, if you walk into a classroom and they have 40 students, you know, there's probably 20 different learning styles in there. And so, you know, the challenge as an edu educator is how do you connect with all those students of, you know, with their different learning styles. And so, um, you know, the idea of uh, advancing personalized learning will help, um, sort of get to the goal of, again, maximizing everyone's learning. Now, this is going to be critical because in terms of outcomes-based education, because OBE will be, again, clearly embedded in this because, again, students are going to be evaluated on what they're learning, not how they're, not necessarily what they're being taught or how they're being taught, but what actually are they learning. And so um, I think certainly if we can, you know, get towards this idea of maximizing everyone's learning, uh, it'll certainly give us, uh, a, you know, give some strong headway in solving uh, the most um, complex challenge that we face, whether it's, you know, in the areas of sustainability, you know, solving, uh, addressing the issues of climate change, or um, in general, just making the world a better place. So um, I guess with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your, uh, for the opportunity to um, talk with you today. And uh, I wish you the very best for a great conference.